Thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Tracy Tokahama Espinosa, and I'm so thrilled to be able to share with you some ideas about why it's never been a better time to be an educator, especially from the perspective of neuroscience, as well as combining that with technology. How has that changed our profiles as teachers this year? Thank you very much for coming. I know you have lots of busy things to do in your life and that you've made space for the shows that it's actually a real priority for you. I appreciate that. I teach a course at Harvard University. It's called the Neuroscience of Learning. It's an introduction to mind, brain, health, and education. And since 2014, We've had 10 iterations of this class. Starting in 2016, we taught it as a 100% online course. It's flipped, it has a two hour synchronous modality. Um, and we've learned a lot from that. We've been collecting data for the past six years on how that actually worked and how successful it's been. It's one of those courses that gets, you know, 4.9, five over five from the students. So we realize we're doing something right, which is what we wanna share with you today. I also had the honor of being a member of the OECD expert panel on teachers' new pedagogical knowledge. Uh, and I serve as the associate editor of Nature Partners Journal Science of Learning. So looking forward to interacting with you and I hope you have tons of questions. Please put them in the chat or in the question box. I, I'd love to talk more with you directly about your particular interest in this. I'd like to invite you now to pull out a piece of paper, anything, or your computer and write this down. Why do I want you to write this down? I want you to write down the address because we have access to this information uh, will be on that web page, but a lot of other things. I'm going to make uh, references, for example, to neural myths and false ideas about the brain. If you'd like to see a whole presentation on that, you can look there. We also have fuller or more longer presentations that have to do with aspects of the brain, which we won't have time to do this morning, but which I'd love to entertain uh, uh, and also get your questions on afterwards. So that's also why you can write my email. I do invite questions. I hope this is the beginning of a great relationship. Make sure that you write down in the subject area which conference this was and be really specific with your questions, but I'd love to follow up with you. Now, this is the first question about the brain, okay? <laughs> Why am I asking you to write this? Why? What would be a reason that I want you to write? The big idea here is that humans write for multiple reasons. Um, the main one is not to forget. In fact, we know from the oldest written things that are out there, <laughs> they were debts, <laughs> basically. Uh, because my memory is fragile and your memory is fragile, and I think you owed me three and you think you owed me two, basically we started to write things because we want to remember. And what we now know, so fascinating, is that there is no learning that involves, that does not have some form of memory and some form of attention. Well-functioning memory systems and well-functioning attention systems are vital to all learning. So we ask you to write because you'll remember a bit more. And so we know that you come to these conferences, lots of information comes at you. And sometimes you think, well, I'll pick up this point or that. I'm gonna challenge you to do something a little more structured here. I'd like you to do a reflection after we meet today. And I'd like to challenge you to do this with every single session you go to. Um, are there th at least three things you didn't know beforehand and um, before you came to this conference? Is there three things that you learned in this session? Are there two things that you're still super curious about? And I wanna go into depth more in that area. And is there one thing you might consider changing in your personal or professional practice based on the information? Why do we structure it like this? If you come to a conference like this, you should learn stuff, you should become curious and you should change. And that's one thing that we know, um, the only way that you can actually make a one-off experience like a conference setting um, last and improve your professional development is if you extend the experience through reflection. So I invite you to do that as well by the end of the session. So we have an agenda in here today to talk about our changing roles as uh, teachers or educators in society these days. We wanna look at that new profile and consider it from the learning sciences perspective, specifically from mind, brain, health, and education, and how that integrates now with technology and what does that tell us about te better teaching and learning situations that we can have. I wanna put this, frame this with the elephant in the room of COVID, right? Um, every problem is an opportunity, and we have been faced with some huge problems in education. Most of you begin planning, thinking, you know, short, medium, long-term planning for your institutions or for your schools or for your projects, and then something like the pandemic shows up, which nobody had planned for. And what we found, uh, we work with schools in um, 40 different countries around the world, um, kindergarten through university. Um, actually, sorry, early childhood education, really zero. People who have kids in school and uh, two months of age onward. And what we found is that 
most of them, at least for a short amount of time, went into this stage of reaction, which is called emergency remote teaching. This means that they just pulled together whatever they could, uh, took their lessons, put them in PDFs, uploaded them somewhere, right, into a cloud, and then shared those things. And some people today, a year later, are still doing that, which is really, really problematic because um, this is kind of like, I, I liken um, the pandemic to um, the stages of grief. I don't know if you guys know Kubler-Ross's work, but she talks about, you know, initially uh, there's denial. <laughs> Basically, it's not gonna happen, not gonna happen. Then you try to negotiate your way out of this and say, well, if I'll do this, but not the other thing. It's really hard. If you are still in this state of denial, um, it, this is why emergency remote learning has really resulted in very low quality education and why many kids are estimated to lose up to a full year of schooling this year um, because things are just not going to go back to the way they were. And I know that's a really hard thing to accept for some of us, but um, if we can get through that, um, we can have another kind of a mindset about this, right? There were some schools, um, kindergarten through 12th grade, as well as some universities who said, wow, this is going to give us the chance to uh, get technology in the classroom, leverage it in the best way possible, get rid of some of the things we've never liked, like standardized testing and other things like that. We're going to do something different. And so their reaction was very, very different. They jumped straight to this, um, you know, acceptance stage. Okay, it is what it is. This is how we have to react to it. Let's be positive about it. And they came up with things, um, unfortunately, in the short term, which were what they already had. Many universities already were running MOOCs. They thought that this is the way that we can run education. We'll just have everybody take a bunch of MOOCs. And other universities said, no, let's run a bunch of webinars. This is the way it's gonna resolve things. What we found is that many of those were definitely, they could be high quality, but they had very low impact, mainly because it's not a sustained experience and or there was no feedback or context given to the information in the case of MOOCs, for example. And so people had a very hard time extending or transferring what they learned in those contexts to the new context, right? So what generated the, the happy place that we wanna to go today has to do with this high quality online teaching. What does that mean? That is high impact, high quality, and that does make a difference. And there are some lessons from there that will last forever, not just when the pandemic goes away, but these are things that are gonna be carried over forever into our educational experience. And so when we looked at this, just one more word about emergency remote learning versus great online courses, we did a large comparison. This is actually appendix B of my upcoming book that comes out next month on this whole topic, but we found 40 differences and they range from things like the level of personalization to the way deeper learning is extended by a good balance of synchronous and asynchronous learning activities, uh, active participation, the completion rates, who finishes these things, right? Looking at mastery learning, um, how instructional design is constructed. So if you want that list, please go ahead and send me an email. I'd be very happy to share that with you. What we would like to frame uh, now is an idea of a move. And for those of you who are still in that remote emergency place, or for those of you who have come up with some solutions, but you're looking to better this, um, I want you to think about the last time you moved, if you have moved in your life. Most of us has moved at least once. And it's a big deal when you move. Um, and this time we're moving to a new modality, a new platform. When you move, you have to think to yourself, you know, what do I keep? which of this furniture comes with me and which gets tossed out? You know, what am I going to give away to other people? Or what am I just going to put in storage? Because maybe someday I'll need it, right? What am I going to replace? And the other things are, what, are I'm, what am I going to need to acquire? And what we found with so many teachers in this past year is that many of them um, were willing to do the work. Uh, and when they were, it was uh, attitude that won the day. It was really the way they approached this challenge that made a whole lot of difference. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit later. We know that all learning is comprised, you know, all competencies are either knowledge, you know, dates, facts, formulas, Googleable stuff, skills, or attitudes and values. And we know that what's most important is having that right, right core before people started. And so uh, I invite you to have a look at this. This is my upcoming book that comes out next month. Um, if you tell them that you attended a conference with me, I think they give it to you like half price or something. So go ahead and do that. In 2017, I had the honor of working uh, with uh, OECD expert panel on teachers new pedagogical knowledge which was pretty fascinating. And the bottom line lessons that came out of that are uh, in the work that we did in part three of this book had to do with looking at the influence of technology and looking at neuroscience. The bottom line is that teachers need more 
neuroscience, more technology in uh, their teacher education programs. Um, there are some groups that have begun to take that in earnest. There's something, for example, called the Deans for Impact in the United States. It's a consortium of teacher colleges that have decided they are going to embrace this whole vision of what the learning sciences bring to teaching and learning. And it's part of their uh, educational curriculum. So it's beginning to happen. But what does this look like globally? We've always presumed that teachers need to know their content, right? If you don't know math, don't be a math teacher, right? But in addition to that, in the 80s and 90s, we began to look at this as saying, well, it's not just knowing your stuff. You have to know how to teach it. Knowing is not enough. You have to know how to teach it. And even more refined is that there's teachers' pedagogical content knowledge. That means that you know, for example, how to identify specific errors that kids might make in a third grade math class, you know, when they're trying to do division. You can anticipate that because you have that specialized knowledge of that content. Therefore, you can teach a little bit more effectively. So we know this has been the way the teaching model all the way up until 2006, when you started to have a TPAC model that included technology. Not only do teachers need to know content and have pedagogical knowledge, they need to know a bit about how to leverage technology. And the main idea is not technology for technology's sake or not because this is a cool tool. The main idea is understanding that it can save us time. There's a lot of tedious stuff that happens. You can get your learning management system to self-correct quizzes, for example, so that you can have more time to talk to the kid about how to improve, right? So the main idea here would be to leverage technology so that we have more time to do the human aspects of teaching and learning. And then most recently, we've added on since 2014, more or less, this idea that teachers need to know a bit more about the brain. And since 2017, when it was recommended to uh, departments of education around the world, this has kind of become the norm. We have to take all of this then, because it is a global movement, a global concept, and put it into context and culture. Now, this means both things. It means understanding the context of your school, the culture of your institution, but it also means national cultures. And nowadays, the context also brings into it this idea that we're talking about modalities. So context and culture also influences whether or not you're teaching online or face-to-face. -face. And we know what you know and how you teach change by the modality that you're in. There are certain things that you might use as uh, core basic skills as a great teacher, but we know that there's other tools that are lending themselves towards achieving certain learning goals when you're in an online context. So we also have additional information that's been wonderful uh, over the past uh, 180 years of formal education. Ever since we've obliged all kids to go to school, we finally uh, now have longitudinal studies. We can actually track kids throughout the lifespan in different contexts and situations to see what has actually had an impact in their learning outcomes. We also now finally have international comparative studies, and that's telling us um, what seems to be true for all brains, right? Uh, and what is highly culturally bound? What things are actually constraining certain types of learning? We also have, have studies based on methodological comparative skills. So we can now compare quantitative and qualitative um, influences or interventions and figure out their, um, uh, how, how strong of an impact they have on learning needs. And addition to that, we now have better information about the brain. So all of this is changing the landscape and giving us an opportunity, thanks to the horrible pandemic, giving us opportunity to apply some of this newer knowledge into the context of things. So just a cautionary, cautionary word about the brain. We know more than ever about the brain, more than the history of humanity. We have learned more things in the past 10 years than in the history of humanity. But we know very little, and you're going to get a lot of people telling you about brain-based education, just run, because those, that's a red flag that people are trying to sell you a product or something. Um, the main idea is to take all of this information with a bit of caution and only use the high quality information. If you talk uh, to Jeff Lickman at Harvard, he tells you, look, we're just beginning this journey. Finally, we have the technology to see things in the brain that we never had before, but we're just beginning. So be very cautious, right? Um, we go from all kinds of things like uh, typical brain scans or what we knew from da Vinci's uh, drawings in the 1500s to what we now call the connectome project, which is the most modern of neuroimaging techniques. And this allows us to have this better visualization, not just simple models, but to look at connectivity in the brain, how are networks formed? Um, and what does this actually look like when we do color enhancement of different parts? What kinds of networks are involved in all of these complex activities that go on in schools and what kinds of activities stimulate 
those particular networks. We know, for example, it takes at least 16 neural networks, which you know, spread out into more than 100 different pathways uh, for a kid to learn to read. And unless all of those networks are timed to work, the kid doesn't read. And, but teachers spend a lot of time you know, talking about symbol to sound, symbol to sound, symbol to sound, which is one of the networks that's really important, but it's not all of them. So if teachers had a better understanding of what it involves to do these behavioral um, activities in our classrooms, like read, um, they'd probably be better at diagnosing a kid's problem and also intervening. This has also allowed us to get rid of a bunch of myths about the brain. And so um, it's very, very clear that for more than 50 years, um, Leslie Hart had a great saying that I love, which is designing educational experiences without an understanding of the brain is like designing a glove without knowing the hand. How can you possibly do this if you don't know a bit more about the brain? So. Uh, understanding how the brain and biology work and how they influence learning outcomes is a key part of teaching and learning these days. And I began this back in 2008, uh, looking at this only from the contributions of other learning sciences like psychology and neuroscience, which brings up uh, mind, brain, and education. And then with the Harvard class, we extended this to mind, brain, health, and education, because there's a lot of things about mental health and physical health, how the body impacts the brain and the brain impacts the body that we believe all teachers should begin to incorporate into their classroom learning. This makes this mind, brain, and education, you know, a sub-element of these greater learning sciences. And the learning sciences do include things like technology, uh, instructional design, how do we order information so that it's best received in, in, in the brain. And so there's a lot of information here that contributes to a different way of approaching teaching and learning dynamics. One of the first things that this means, as far as the steps, is let's get rid of the myths. We find that no matter how much you teach people about the good information, if they believe mythically that men and women's brains are so different, they have different potentials, or that they're only using 10% of their brain, or that they're right and left brain, if they believe in myths, they will never take in the good information. So the very first step would be, can we get rid of those myths? And so we did several studies looking at um, larger and larger groups of people. The last one was uh, in 30 different countries with 112 experts trying to get confirmation. What is it that we should really teach teachers about the brain and learning? And these are hyperlinked to the presentation you can receive if you'd like to read those 600 page studies each, that's, you're welcome to it. <laughs> um, we used a categorization scheme used by the OECD um, in 2002. They said that information is pretty much based on uh, what's well-established. Um, what are teachers reading? They're reading some stuff that's good well-established information. Then there's stuff that's probably so, like we believe that there's no critical period for anything you learn in academic um, settings. So there might be a critical period for your first language. Um, these things are probably so, right? Uh, intelligent speculation, you know, men and women look different on the outside, so their brains are probably different. Well, that's intelligent speculation, but with very little evidence behind it, right? And then there are things that are myths, just outright myths. And the idea here is to get rid of those myths so that teachers um, can begin to be better practitioners. And in doing that, I actually wrote a very serious book with a terrible, sorry, my editor, who knows what they were thinking when they gave this cover to this book, but they, uh, it's a very serious book. Um, and we look at more than 70 uh, myths that are still in teacher literature. Um, and the main idea behind all of this is that myths do harm they limit a person's potential. And if we can't get rid of those myths and mythical thinking in education, we won't be able to bring in good information about the brain. So things about people having learning styles or being able to multitask or differences between male and female brains or the fixed uh, nature of learning that's related to ages. Why do we separate kids by ages? You know, that's one of those crazy things, right? Um, the fact that uh, intelligence is malleable and that people, you know, we don't use just 10% of our brains, all right? And, or that old people can't learn. There's a lot out there. So these things have to be um, moved into the back burner, got rid of, debunked, and then we can get into the good information. And so the good information would be things like principles. And there's only six of them that these experts have been able to agree on over the past 13 years. And they are things that are probably uh, familiar to many of you. And there are no two brains that are identical. While there are similar neural networks across humans, um, there's no, no two brains that are identical, mainly because uh, your brain is changed by experience. And no two people have the exact same experiences, right? We know that you know, nature and nurture influence things. So people are born with different potentials for different learning. 
Um, we know that prior experience, all new learning passes through the filter of prior experience. Your brain is super efficient. It doesn't want to uh, spend energy on new stuff. So it tries to look for what it already knows about information. There are constant changes in the brain, um, and most of them happen at a molecular level before they happen at a behavioral level. So like we mentioned, this kid learning how to read, you can spend you know, days and weeks and months you know, trying to teach this kid to read, and one day he just reads, right? And that's kind of crazy, but there's a lot going on you know, at a molecular level that you just can't see until you see the behavior that yes, he can read, right? We know that uh, your brain is neuroplastic. It learns throughout the lifespan. And we also know, as we mentioned earlier, that all learning requires memory and attention. And so these are some core things that independent of culture or age, all of these things are true about human brains. Human brains uh, function similarly in this way. But when we get to the tenants, tenants are things that are true. And by the way, there are no truths in science. There's just evidence or lack of evidence, right? But I'm gonna use the word truth because it's easier to understand. But there are things that are true about human learning, but there's a huge range of human variants. For example, motivation. Is, do you need to be motivated to learn? Obviously, but what motivates you doesn't necessarily motivate me, right? Uh, sleep and dreaming. Sleep is vital, vital to be able to pay attention. And dreaming, in the stages of dreaming, which is typically REM state, there's a combination of neurotransmitters, of chemicals that help you consolidate memory. So sleep and dreaming are vital for attention and memory. But how much sleep an individual needs varies um, greatly. Uh, four and a half to 12 is absolutely normal. Eight might be average, but um, there's a variety here. There's a variance, a human variance here for all of these things. So what we try to do is help teachers understand what are basics about human brains, principles, and what are the tenants and how they influence learning. And then again, we have to put all of this into a context of understanding what happens in an online context, which is slightly different. So if I were to ask you just right now, sit for a second and think, what do you think influences quality teaching and learning? Independent, I mean, if it's online, not online, but what is quality teaching and learning? And I'm gonna take a, just go ahead and write down at least one thing. One thing you think influences teaching and learning. One thing you know makes a difference, okay? I'm going to lay money that some of you said, oh, yeah, it's the planning. We have to have clear objectives. And once we have the objectives, we know how to evaluate. Once we know how to evaluate, we can choose the right activities. Backward design, backwards engineer the problem. Perfect. That's a great way to think about it. Planning is very important. Other people will say instructional design. When we're online, we have to save all that energy, that heavy cognitive load of having people guessing where things are in the online platform, lay it out aesthetically beautiful, intuitive, and then they will learn because they'll know where to find the information. That's also important. Tools. Some of you are here just to get the latest and the greatest tools that are out there. I wanna know what the best software is or the best apps or how people use this information. That's, that's also important. Tools are very, very important. We have a list, if you'd like, of more than 600 tools that we found that are free and open source and uh, very interesting tools. But the tools mean nothing if you don't have the planning, right? You can't just apply a tool without a clear objective, right? So choose the tools wisely. We also think that some people um, have come to realize how much different it is, how different it is to manage a group of people online as opposed to face-to-face. -to -face. And teachers get frustrated and they say, why aren't you turning your camera on or participate or whatever? Because they're so used to being able to walk over, put their hand on the kid's shoulder, bring him back to focus. Um, you have to do different things in learning online. Um, so that might be on some of your minds, right? Other people think that you know, methodologies, the strategies, the activities that we apply in the classroom have to be uh, appropriate. Absolutely, they absolutely do. Sometimes you need to have direct explicit instruction and sometimes you need to have uh, more indirect instruction and inductive reasoning. You have to choose your activities based on your objective, absolutely. But one thing that we have found that's really interesting is in this list of online pedagogies, and if you are around and for the, for the session uh, a little bit later today, I'm gonna talk about 40, Online pedagogies we found work equally well online as face-to-face, -face, supported by mind, brain, health, and education uh, information. Pedagogies are important, but I'm gonna cut to the chase on most of those. The bottom line has to do with something almost nobody thinks about, um, relationships. Um, the teachers who prioritized mental health, then looked at critical thinking, uh, then thought about the curriculum, were actually you know, pretty successful during the pandemic. Um, and the people who only uh, prioritized curriculum were pretty poor. 
did a pretty lousy job. And so we know that there's a lot of things that influence online teaching and learning. So we tried to take all of these things in the mix and try to see what we could get out of it. Now, this sort of, some of you are gonna say, hey, that looks just like, you know, prioritize mental health, prioritize uh, sleep, feeling good, feeling safe. That's very Maslow. Yes, it is. Maslow's hierarchy of needs has sort of been revisited, but we have this more modern vision of this. Um, there's a lot of problems in learning that have to do with physical things. Uh, kids just don't sleep enough or they don't eat breakfast or they have bad eyesight and you know they're being judged for that. Um, but there's a lot of other things that happen in a psychological realm. If it's not a physical thing, then ask if it's a psychological. Um, is the kid just totally stressed out because of these situations? They can't see friends or make friends. Um, they really need to be together. Um, that has to be prioritized then over the content. Um, and if it's not physical and it's not psychological, could it be something that has a neurological base to it? And if it is something that's neurologically founded, you have to divide. Is, are we looking at general cognitive things, which is memory, attention, and executive functions, or is it really domain specific? And we will use this with reading specialists and math tutors. We found that they were often referred to the math tutor or reading specialist. And it was always something lower down the chain. So try to scale up your interventions to try to figure out what it is that kids really need in the classroom. So if we look at some of the tools that are possible and available and how we teach, um, I just wanna give you a concrete example of what we do in the class at Harvard. We have uh, large group sessions and there's two amazing things that we can do online that we actually can't do when we're face to face, which is kind of cool. We can take advantage of something called the disinhibition effect Basically, people who are online are a little bit freer to share. Um, there's kind of this you know, imaginary protective field here that I share a bit more um, when you're actually not sitting in the same room with somebody, which is kind of crazy, right? We also know that if you have a really well-run session where you can see everybody's faces and names, um, we have a huge advantage in that sense, um, mainly because in regular real life classrooms, you're looking half the time, you're looking at the back of somebody's head. Whereas if you've got a really well-run well Zoom session, you're seeing everybody's face. And we know that social contagion is real and humans cont are contagious in their emotions, mainly through their faces and tones of voices. And so we know that having that interaction and that dynamic within a Zoom session can be equally or more powerful uh, than it can be in face-to-face, -face, especially these days when face-to-face -face means sitting six feet apart with a mask on and all facing the same direction, right? We also have people's names available so that you can personalize and call on and say, hey, Andrew, I see you have your hand up or you had a great question here in the chat. Let's talk about this, right? So by personalizing this, you're able to make this new structure um, actually better than sometimes face-to-face -face when you can't remember oh my gosh, there's 50 people in this classroom. How am I going to remember their names? Well, now you have this uh, added advantage there. We also know that people who know how to leverage the use of the breakout rooms create a far higher um, personalization of their class by creating authentic learning moments, by sending students out to discuss things, smaller group, come up with some great ideas together, come back to the larger group. Um, this allows them, in our class, we make them come back and we'll say, hey, Jenny, who was in your group? So they realize, oh, I got to know who's in my group, and I have to synthesize what the group said. Huge skill sets to be able to synthesize that kind of information and bring that back. We also know that if you use the chat, we leverage the chat to no end. We have our teaching fellows are on the chat the whole time. The main reason we use it so actively is because we want to encourage this back channel for clarification. Why? Because your brain can't let it go. If you have a question, you got to get it out there or you won't be able to go on to the next topic. So if I say something and it went over your head and you need to get clarification, this is an amazing way to do this. Is people say, well, what did she just say? She said, Paul Bakirita, how do you spell that? Oh, here's his, here's his name and here's, how, here's some of his most famous works. So we use that chat to keep the flow going to help people satisfy their questions. It's the worst thing ever to tell a group of people, keep your questions till the end. This is why I would totally love a different kind of a flipped conference session where you send the video beforehand, you guys already have your questions and we have a dynamic exchange. That's actually far better for deeper learning, right? So think about uh, maximizing the use of a live chat there, right? We also use quizzes, but not to give a final grade. We know that there's a huge amount of evidence for low stakes um, testing, for frequent low stake testing, which enhances memory. 
So in our class, we have a quiz every single week. Um, you can take it as many times as you want to. We don't care. We just want you to dominate the vocabulary and the concepts that are in there. We also use discussion boards, not as kind of a uh, check, you know, to see if somebody did the homework, but rather to build community. Um, we put a juicy prompt that has to do with a pre-class video up there. We have people exchange, and then we ask them to please share with, uh, sorry, respond to at least two other people in a shorter response. And they're not allowed to say things like, oh, nice idea, or I agree with you. No, they have to go deeper. And this is fantastic for building up this community exchange. And we get an awful lot of people who go back and forth more than that minimal, you know, two times, but they end up having these longer conversations. In the first two weeks of my class, we had 3,000 individual conversations going on based on uh, the first uh, two prompts that we had. It was pretty amazing. And so we know that this enhances um, the sense of community and peer learning in this sense, right? We use reflection papers after every single synchronous encounter. So anytime we meet a face-to-face, -face, either in a section or a live class, we ask people to do a three, two, one reflection, three things they didn't know before, two things they're interested in learning more about, and one thing that they might change. And this actually, Give some downtime. In education, we are really, really guilty of just bombarding people with tons of information, and we don't give enough reflection time. Those of you who like uh, uh, graphic arts, you know that there's a reason that we give white space, right? It's to let your eye rest. Um, when you do good design, you have a nice flow to things. The idea here is taking the time to reflect is excellent for consolidating understanding, of information. And so we have them send that to us. It helps us um, check, you know, did I, what I thought was important is what they thought was important. And also for misconceptions, I learned X. Well, that's not true. It gives us a chance to correct for misconceptions there. Okay. Um, we also use ePortfolios. This means uh, instead of having a single one off uh, formative assessment, uh, sorry, uh, summative assessment, we have ongoing um, formative documents that are kept all together over the entire semester. Um, and we know that now um, many universities, um, all the Ivy Leagues have sort of tossed out this idea that we don't need those tests anymore to go to the United States universities. The entire California education system says, nope, we're not gonna do those uh, SAT exams anymore. We'd much prefer to have a different look at a student long-term to watch their growth over time and to see real artifacts of their learning. So e-portfolios are now, uh, now possible because we have online platforms. And finally, the best uh, of the best I will leave to last, which are min uh, bundles. Um, this is something that we coined about six years ago. They're actually mini libraries um, that allow every student in our class to enter and find supplementary material that's at their level. What does this mean? At Harvard, we have to have undergraduate students, graduate students, and non-credit students in the same classroom. That means it's up to me to differentiate. So if I wanna teach about neuroanatomy and neuroplasticity or memory or language or any of these things, I'm gonna have a very big variety of people in my class. In order to maintain the same goal, I have to offer multiple entry points of that in, to that information so that people can finally reach the same goal together. So what do we do? We, in my class, we have a weekly um, bundle uh, on the topic of the week with multiple entry points to the information. These are all free and open source, um, open access information. It's not just uh, peer reviewed journals, but somebody, uh, maybe we're doing neuroplasticity and somebody knows nothing about it. They've not taken an online class ever in their life. They don't know anything about neuroanatomy. We show them a 60 second cartoon. Um, but maybe somebody knows a little bit more, we'll show them a 20 minute TED talk. And somebody who's absolutely brilliant, they'll start to read the scientific papers. And somebody else will actually look into, you know, the six hour long lecture by the Nobel Prize laureate and then, you know, be given um, their whole document. So we have these multiple entry points to allow people to have basic conceptual knowledge of the information as they work towards mastery. So these are some of the tools that we use. Um, and I would like to invite you, um, nothing is better than a work model. We know that if you don't, or if you're starting out on something, um, it's really clear that if you see something that looks like something ideal, um, and I'd like to think our class reaches, you know, is pretty close to doing something really great in this um, area, I'd like to invite you to take a tour. Uh, one of my teaching fellows did this. 
uh, and you can hyperlink and just walk through the whole class and you can see how that class, that instructional design is constructed and why we do the things that we do. So with that in mind, I'd like to then um, just sort of turn this over and summarize um, a few basic ideas. There are some real benefits and huge potentials for the way education is moving now. Um, our course starts and meets students at their, at their starting point. That is huge. Um, because we flip, we have much deeper learning. You know, they get the superficial information that was a typical lecture recorded. Then they, they come to the live class after having the discussion board and the quizzes to have a much deeper conversation about that information. We can differentiate homework because of the bundle structure. All of the work is naturally interdisciplinary, which is a huge goal that we have in mind, brain, health, and education. The structure lends itself to mastery. Oops, sorry. For those of you who are looking at the bottom line, it's totally less expensive to teach online <laughs> to structure this once you've bought into the infra, once you've bought into the uh, hardware and all the rest of it. Yes, definitely, it's definitely a less expensive way to go about th doing things. But for me, the most wonderful thing is that it reaches a wider audience. Um, we have students in our class uh, this semester from 19 different countries. You have no idea how that changes the understanding of the information. When you have somebody from Russia talking to somebody from Australia who tells somebody else in Hong Kong what they think about things in Iran, it's amazing to actually get this whole format going. And um, that is one of the promises of higher education that very few universities are latching onto. And if they did, it would be, it's the way to go. All future learning is gonna have that perspective taking, okay? So the four big messages I want you to take away is let the machines do what the machines do best, but let humans do what they do best. Make more time for that human touch. Make more time for telling that kid, I know you're frustrated right now, but I think you can do it. You know, what do you think you need to be able to do? To, what do you need to do to get better next time? Feed forward. Don't look backwards. Tell me what you're going to do better the next time, right? Leverage some of these old tools, discussion boards, quizzes for new purposes, right? And you should definitely, especially during these times of pandemic, we know how much the students, all they really want is to be together, which is kind of interesting. So having multiple breakout rooms, small group sessions where people get to talk to other people, make new friends, it, it's been huge um, in facilitating then they're, they're open now to other types of learning, right? And finally, um, just accept this is different, but it can be better. Um, than we had before. And so I would just like to throw my hat in the ring that I think that this is a, a very positive change. We've been living through hard times, but I think it's definitely positive. So in general, it saves time, it reaches more students, we can differentiate more, and it's a much more personalized way of doing things despite your intuition thinking otherwise, okay? If you have the time, please come. We'll talk about these 14, uh, 40 pedagogies. If you don't have time to come to my session, please write me and I'll send you a hyperlink to the list of these pedagogies that actually work in online settings equally well, okay? Do take the time right now, if you can, to think, are there three things I learned that I didn't know beforehand, or nah, I know all this stuff already. Are there two things that you are now terribly curious about, you wanna know a lot more about? And is there one thing you might change? And with that, I'll open up to questions. If there's things that you wanna know more about and you wanna say them out loud right now, this is the time to do this, okay? So if I go to the chat, I see learning science, so good to be please communication, relationships, motivation. So I see some, so uh, Maria, are you asking, uh, are you saying relationships are important or do you wanna know more about relationships? Same thing, motivation. These single word things aren't telling me what you wanna know, okay? <laughs> so if you have questions, please articulate a clear question, right? Luis Felipe, okay. Kahoot, quizzes, forms, polls, Quizlet, all of those things are very cool, but it depends on your objective when you use them. And they should be supplementary to your objective. They do not have to do things that you do just because they're fun for kids, okay?